Hey everybody, welcome. I'm the uh, state chef at Eagle Nook Winery. My name is Alex Lovick. And today we're gonna be talking about our 2019 estate olive oil and about our olive oil in general, as far as that goes. As we talk about the oil and talk about what we're gonna be doing, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in. Ted is moderating, he'll help us out and he'll interject at any point um, with questions for me, okay? So uh, be happy to answer anything. So our, um, we're gonna have two screens over here. We've got the demo. So down here, I'm gonna be showing you um, how, to, how to do some of these recipes at home. And the other screen, clearly, for now anyway, is gonna be focused on me. Um, so our olive oil, here's the 2019 bottle. Um, we, we have over 800 olive trees on property. We do not press it on property, but we take it up to a mill in Hopland. It's called Olivino. And uh, they're a great, um, they do some great custom milling for olive oil and they make their own products there as well, I believe. Um, we have over 800 trees on property. The trees have been growing here for a long time. Some of them have been planted more recently in the past 20, 30 years. Some of them have been around for quite a while. Uh, the varieties that we have are Arbicania, Karaneki, Frantoyo, Pichelin, Mission, and Saviano. So this is a mix of, um, sorry, Greek, Italian, and Spanish varietals. So these are all blended into our olive oil, and they really kind of make up the flavor profile for what it is. Olive oil, kind of like wine, it, it does, of course, it, it is affected by terroir. So, of course, where it's grown, climate, soil, all of that um, plays a big role in how the olive oil ends up tasting. And also just something interesting to consider regarding um, products like this, where they're very unique to where they're grown, how, they're, how the trees are taken care of. Uh, when they're harvested, that's a really big one that can affect flavor profile. Um, and it makes each one of them unique and it makes ours very much unique as well. So olives on our property, they're harvested right after grape harvest or not long after, sometimes a couple weeks after. So if we finish up our harvest in um, say October, then by the end of October, sometimes the beginning of November, we're harvesting our olives. So we harvest our olives when they're still green. So that makes for um, a really pretty exciting olive oil that's very, um, very flavorful. It's pungent. It really kind of packs a punch. So it makes for something that's a really great accent to a lot of different dishes, both savory and sweet. So that's what we're gonna be talking about a little bit later that there are plenty of sweet applications for olive oil. Some of you may have already um, played around with doing sweet things with olive oil. For those of you who haven't, it's pretty fun. There are a couple of recipes for you um, that you should have already where you can test that out. Um, all right, so one of the things we're gonna talk about briefly are tasting notes of olive oil and um, what those are typically comprised of. So um, right here I printed out the scorecard that um, you see, hopefully you guys can see that, that you see Davis um, uses. And the very first section on there are um, perception of defects. So one of the first things that um, folks do when they're grading olive oil specifically for extra virgin is they talk about the defects. So extra virgin olive oil needs to be free of defects. And then beyond that, it should have uh, really nice balanced flavors. So briefly, we're going to talk about these defects. And then briefly, we'll talk about some of the tasting notes that you can pick up as you taste the olive oil. And then I encourage you, if you're interested to, uh, you can just type into Google olive oil scorecard UC Davis, it'll come up. So just for fun, if you're interested, you can print it out and uh, kind of do a tasting yourself. You can compare a couple olive oils just for the sake of interest and see, see how it works out for you. So the way, the way it works is that if hopefully you can, see this that um, the very first one is fusty or muddy sediment and then there's a line so what folks do is after they taste the olive oil they'll just place a mark where they think the intensity of this characteristic lies for them personally the weakest being at the beginning strongest at the end and then at the end 
they kind of take an average of their marks to really dictate um, how they ended up grading the olive oil. So it's kind of interesting, rather than going uh, specifically zero to 10 or on a number scale, it's kind of just by how you feel regarding the intensity. Um, so briefly, some of the uh, defects that you might experience in an olive oil, these are kind of unique terms to olive oil. Fusty or muddy, musty or earthy, whiny, vinegary, um, acidic or sour, metallic, rancid, and others. Um, fusty or muddy tends to pertain to uh, whether or not, so sometimes as the olives are waiting to be pressed, sometimes they're in a container that's wet, they can actually start fermenting. Um, that can lead to something like that. Musty, earthy, that could be mold on the olives before they're processed, and you can actually taste that in the finished product if, if that happens. Uh, whiny, vinegary, or acidic, that tends to be from anaerobic fermentation. So same thing, if you have unwanted fermentation during the process, just from the olives sitting, um, say, in some liquid or something like that. Uh, metallic can be from contact with um, metals that um, are reactive. So if they spend time in a container that has a reactive surface that's made of a particular metal that's reactive, then it can um, end up imparting that flavor on there. Uh, rancidity and other flavors. Um, rancidity can be from oxidization, which happens to a lot of olive oil that we have at home. So olive oil is something that really needs to be or should be consumed when it's young, kind of the opposite of wine in that sense where you typically can age wine. Olive oil is kind of the opposite. You want to use it uh, when it's really young. That's when it's most uh, vibrant and exciting. If you, it, it's difficult to get olive oil right after it's pressed, even though that's the ideal time. So the next best thing really is purchasing it from sources where you know um, can confirm on some level the farming practices and when it was pressed. So uh, ideally, um, if if an olive oil is stored properly, you can consume it 12 to 18 months after it's been pressed and bottled. And after you open it, typically you want to use it within six months. Um, otherwise, it, it will start oxidizing. And as it oxidizes, uh, all the flavors really become muted. It starts tasting sort of stale and eventually it can develop some rancid characteristics. So these are standards that are, are common to the Olive Oil Council um, that is active in California. They're not necessarily standards that are active internationally. So something you'll find is a lot of international made oils. They could be a blend of say Spanish, uh, Greek oil, Italian oil. Um, this is not to say that exclusively this occurs, but sometimes they'll be labeled extra virgin and you don't actually know the parameters with which they were created to achieve that status. So in California or in the States, if you see something that has a stamp that's been rated extra virgin by a certain council, um, then you know that it's probably reached a certain level of quality. So for us, we don't have that certification, but, but I know firsthand exactly um, how this olive oil tastes and, um, and also when it's harvested and how fresh it is. So uh, our olive oil um, is indeed really quite beautiful and really fits within the parameters of what we've been discussing here. Some of the other flavors that are incorporated into observing tasting notes in olive oil include green or ripe fruit, so like freshly cut grass, um, green banana, uh, green tea, there are things like citrus or something that um, can come off as peppery that you might pick up um, for ripe fruit. You, common one is ripe banana. It's kind of interesting. If you think about it next time you taste um, a nice ripe olive oil, ripe banana is, is um, pretty easy to pick up a lot of the times. Uh, nutty, floral, um, notes of avocado. So anyway, um, Kind of interesting, and the, and the way you taste olive oil is similar to wine, where for folks that maybe haven't done this before, it might seem a little unusual, but it's really just like wine where you take a tiny sip, um, aerate it on your palate, let it coat your palate, swallow, and then really start considering and analyzing the flavors. So mouthfeel is another big one for olive oil. Does it come off as kind of uh, silky and buttery on the palate, or does it come off as sort of greasy and oily? So those are another 
those are other characteristics to look for where you, you kind of want it to hit on levels that is always going to be pleasant, ideally. Um, so those are kind of the basics as far as um, how to taste olive oil and what you might look for. A couple of things that are also important are the ideas of bitterness and pungency. So bitterness is exactly what that sounds like. It's picking up on bitter flavors that are in the olive oil. Pungency is the peppery sensation that you pick up on the back of your throat that might make you want to cough. So for those of you that have tasted a really strong, bright, fresh olive oil might make you cough. And that along with the bitter component are actually very favorable qualities in an olive oil because they're indicators of freshness. So while those aren't flavor characteristics that we seek out, otherwise normally in everything that we like to eat, in olive oil, it's an indicator of a, of a healthy, fresh olive oil that's been made well. So something to take note that if it's very strong in flavor, if you sense um, the gut bitterness and pungency, if it makes the back of your throat tickle and taste peppery, uh, those are good things. And those are things that when it comes to using it as a flavor, you, you use that really to think about how you're going to use it as an accent to balance flavors that are already on your dish. So typically, if it's a really strong olive oil, if it tastes really strong, I'll use it sparingly. I'll use it to finish dishes or use it in a way where um, it allows it the natural flavor profile to come through versus getting masked. Like, I uh, won't necessarily cook with it a whole lot unless it's very low key. Um, if you have like a seared piece of fish or something and you drizzle it on once it's on the plate, things like that where you can really use that as an accent um, and it's quite nice in that way. Um, so let's see, we've gone over the basic flavor profiles. Um, so, oh, the other thing that's sort of interesting as far as how olive oil is tasted and how it's graded is they, they use a blue glass. So it's a little tiny uh, rounded sort of shot glass looking um, piece, of, piece of glass and it's blue. It's kind of like um, these dishes here, if you can see this blue hue. And the reason is that um, that way you mask the color of the olive oil when you're tasting it. So for when you're comparing a bunch of different olive oils, the color can influence the way you rate it. Um, it's just kind of the way our brains work. Same thing with wine, that if you're uh, truly doing a blind wine tasting and you don't know whether it's white or red, it's actually kind of surprising uh, the degree to which sometimes it's difficult for your brain to decipher which one it is if you don't see the color. So at home when you do it, I wouldn't worry about it too much, especially if you're just tasting one or two. You can just put a few drops in a small wine glass or a shot glass and do it that way. And it's kind of a fun exercise. All right. So what I want to do is um, show you a couple of quick recipes that you can execute at home. You should have four recipes all together. Two of them are sweet, two of them are savory. Um, the, the first one is a shaved fennel salad. It's, it's kind of a traditional Italian uh, simple dish that happens to be um, quite wine friendly. I think it goes with uh, our white wines particularly well. And the other dish is going to be a cracker. Uh, in Italian, it's carta di musica. Um, it's meant to, uh, the name suggests that it's like sheet music. So you roll the dough out super thin so you can see through it like paper. Um, and then you bake it. It's very simple. Uh, we're going to make it and then brush olive oil on it afterwards. It's a nice way to show, um, show the olive oil and for it to pick up a little bit of that flavor characteristic. The two sweet dishes, I'm not going to demonstrate those to you today, but the recipes are pretty clear. Um, it's two other ways in which you can make something really delicious for dessert uh, using, using olive oil. Um, if you have any questions regarding any of these recipes after this or any questions in general, don't hesitate to contact us. You can email me directly if you'd like. It's my name with a period in between at inglenook.com. So it's alex.lovick at inglenook.com. Always happy to answer whatever questions you have. If you have any thoughts or ideas, uh, don't hesitate. Um, I like talking about food, so I'm happy to help out. All right, so we're gonna go into our first recipe. The first recipe is the shaved fennel salad. So for the shaved fennel salad, we're gonna be using a mandolin. So just a heads up, um, for those of you who haven't used a mandolin, um, chances are you're gonna cut yourself on it. 
there's no uh, there's no other way around it. So what we want to do though is we want to minimize the degree to which that can happen easily. So I'll give you some some tips um, in order to use it safely. So I'll encourage everybody to be particularly careful if you're going to use an analog. Alternatively, you can use a sharp knife and just slice the panel very thinly. Um, but if you're using a mandolin, um, please be careful. It does come with a guard usually. So you can use the guard. I'll encourage you to do that. If you're using your hands, which we're going to do today, I'll show you a way uh, that will make it a little safer. So we're going to be using a mandolin to slice our fennel. All right. Um, our other ingredients are going to include Parmesan cheese. We're going to use a uh, lemon zest and lemon juice, our estate olive oil, of course, salt and pepper. This um, dish is really great on its own as a side. It'll really work with uh, any meal. During the summertime, I've actually been making this at home every once in a while, and I will add some half cherry tomatoes, some torn basil. Uh, recently, I did one with uh, corn that I just briefly cooked and then cut off the cob and added it to this. So you can add these types of seasonal flourishes to this. It's great as is, what I'm going to show you. But just keep that in mind that as ingredients keep coming in during the summertime, don't hesitate to play around with it a little bit. So besides being a good side on its own, it's also something that is a natural accompaniment to fish. It's to me, fennel and seafood is always a great marriage. Uh, as well as the fact that it has lemon juice in there. It works really well. Um, if you are having something like a grilled steak, a pile of this on top of your grilled steak is absolutely delicious as well. All right, so we're going to start off um, by shaving our fennel. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this fennel in half just to make sure it fits on the mandolin. If you have small heads of fennel, you don't necessarily have to cut it in half. You can just um, start cutting down. I trim the bottom just a little bit and then um, trim the tops. So the way we're going to be shaving it today is going to be straight down. So the stem end, which is this end, straight down towards the root end. You can shave it other directions. Like if you, if you shave it um, this way, for example, you'll get really nice cross sections, but it, it's, it can be a little more dangerous really. So I'm kind of going with the safer method first. And then um, if you feel comfortable, feel free to explore with different ways of cutting. So we're going to go ahead and just shave this. I trim the top, trim the bottom. We're going to go straight down. I'm going to check this. And basically, we want it to be, I don't know if you can see that, but it's, it's basically, it's thicker than paper. Not quite paper thin. I like it to have a little bit of texture. So my tip for this is when you get low enough so that the piece of fennel is shorter and is a little more sturdy on the um, mandolin, then you can start using your palm. So put your palm on it flat. This already is, in case you slip, it's going to be a lot safer than if you're gripping it like this. This always makes me cringe, but if your fingers are like this, then there's a much better chance you're going to go right up against the flip. So palm flat, fingers out, kind of curled up a little bit, and then you can finish up until you get to the very root end. Um, use as much as you can, a little bit at the end. You can always save those for your, uh, you know, fennel soup or your stock that you're making, the stock that you have simmering in the background, you can throw it in there. Um, or if your dog's like mine, you can feed it to him. He likes stuff like that. All right, so the same thing, we're gonna do this with the other piece. So the recipe does give you quantities and weights for how much you should expect to use. I'm just gonna do a small amount since you guys get the idea. If you're not watching me shave all of it. So we're just going to do one bowl for the time being. All right, so we're going straight down, using the palm of my hand, keeping my fingers stretched out. So far, so good. Oh boy, it's getting really close. All right, I'm going to stop. Remember, your hands are more important than the fennel. So once you get low, just stop. 
It's not worth it. Okay. So we have all this beautiful shape done on here now. All right. Um, the next kind of um, primary flavor component here is going to be the Parmesan cheese. So what I do with this is just take a vegetable peeler. You can use any kind of peeler and go ahead and just strip it down just like that. We're just going really just kind of random, not trying to get a specific width or a specific length that is going to um, get broken up in there a little bit anyway. So. Uh, there is, of course, specific quantity for this too in your recipe. So for the purposes of this video, we're going to eyeball it. Which after you mix this once or twice, of course, it's totally okay to eyeball stuff. Do stuff to taste. Okay, so we have our Parmesan cheese in there. Uh, this is not on your recipe, but I do like to put some lemon zest in here too. I don't put it all on the recipe that way people show up and pay attention to get the secret tips. All right. So, you know, for, for the amount that you guys are doing in that recipe, if you do you know, approximately one lemon's worth of zest, that's probably good. Okay, got some lemon zest in there. Now, um, we have our fennel, we have our lemon zest, we have our Parmesan cheese, now we're going to dress it. So we're using freshly squeezed lemon juice. Freshly squeezed makes a big difference. Don't buy those uh, those bottles of, those lemon shaped bottles of lemon juice at the store. Um, they don't, they don't taste like fresh lemons. Um, go, it's, to me, it's well worth it to not only have fresh lemons, but squeeze them right before you use them. Fresh lemon juice oxidizes quickly and uh, flavor profile kind of gets less and less interesting. So fresh lemon juice will always make your dishes taste more vibrant. All right, now we have our estate olive oil that's going in here. Salt. And freshly ground pepper. Toss it all together. Use your clean hand or you can use tongs as well. It's gonna get plated if, if you're doing it just as a side on its own. Plate it on its own just like this. I like to have a nice pile coming up. Do it in a few stages, that way you'll get some kind of some height, makes it look prettier. All right, and then for garnish, so the way the way these heads of fennel came, they came with the fronds still attached there. Some of it was trimmed, but there's still all these lovely fronds up here that have flavor and they're pretty. So I like to use those as garnish. You can also chop them and, and add it to the salad itself. If you don't have access to fennel fronds or your folds of fennel are already trimmed on the bottom, then uh, use chopped parsley instead. It works very well. Okay. All right, and there it is. I hope everybody can see that. This is our fennel salad. It's delicious, it's simple. And like I mentioned earlier, you can absolutely add some seasonal flourishes to it. That'll make it really good. So have it on its own. Have it with some fish. Have it on your grilled steak. It's good no matter which way you cut it. Uh, th this, I mentioned briefly earlier, goes great with our white wines, either Sauvignon Blanc or Blancano. Blancano is kind of a tricky pairing um, because it's a very delicate wine. Um, and this actually works really well with it. All right, so that's the first recipe that we just worked through. Um, the next one that we're gonna work through is the cracker, the carta di musica. So this dough, uh, I'm suggesting in the recipe that you mix it and then let it 
um, rest in the fridge overnight. As it rests, the flower gets to fully hydrate. There's some enzymatic activity that occurs. Uh, you end up to me with a slightly more delicate cracker that is kind of worth, worth the wait. If, if you forget or, or, or just don't do it, it's okay too, but make sure you rest it at least a couple hours. And if you do it the same day, resting it at room temperature is probably better. So we're gonna roll it through a pasta machine. I have a pasta, um, a pasta roller set up right here. You wanna, you wanna start with a, a relatively small piece unless you're a super professional pasta viola or a pasta viola. If you're really comfortable with your pasta roller, then you can go with a pretty big piece. Um, I suggest starting off small so, so one does not get overwhelmed because sometimes working with the pasta roller can get really tricky really fast. So I took a piece of this dough. So just for reference, if, if uh, you don't have the recipe in front of you, this is two cups of all-purpose flour, one cup of durum flour, one cup of water, one and a quarter teaspoons of salt. Very simple. That's all it is. The for those of you who haven't worked with durum, durum's another type of wheat that's most commonly sold in the form of semolina, uh, which is kind of a, a coarser grind. If you can find the fine milled durum, some stores will have finely milled durum. I advise using that. If you can't, semolina is good too. Uh, provides flavor and some favorable dough characteristics. So I think it's worth seeking out. So we, as I mentioned earlier, we mixed this. I let it um, rest for quite a while. Now we're gonna roll it through our pasta roller. So I like to form it into a basic square first. So it really helps out with maintaining a kind of a manageable shape as you roll it through the pasta roller. Before we start rolling that, we're gonna prepare a cookie sheet. I like to bake this on the back of a cookie sheet. It's just easier to handle, easier for me to lay down. So we're gonna grease the back of this with some olive oil. The instructions um, advise, uh, I think 400 degrees for the baking temperature in a certain time. Just know that every oven is very different. So. Anytime you're baking something, it really kind of is the type of situation where you bake it until it's done. If it's burning and the timer hasn't gone off yet, that's an indicator that maybe maybe our ovens are different. So um, so keep an eye on it. So basically, be careful and check it. With this cracker in particular, as you'll see a little bit later, we're going just for a nice even golden brown all the way through so that it's crispy. Okay. So we have a piece of dough that I formed into a square. I'm gonna start running that through the pasta roller now. And uh, true to the name of this recipe, true to the name of this cracker, we're gonna roll it until you can see through it. So it's thin like paper, all right? This pasta machine here, zero is the widest setting, and um, uh, I'm sorry, the other way around. Ten, ten is the widest setting, zero is the the thinnest setting. So I'm going to take this all the way down to about 0 0.5, maybe just a little thinner than that. I didn't. It I use as little flour as necessary. As you can see, those first several rounds, I didn't need any. I just dusted a little bit right now. And it doesn't stick as we get thinner. So we're going to do uh, two or three more passes and I'll show you what to do next. All right, this is going to be the last run here. All right, 
nice and thin. Um, as you could, I think you can see here, you can see my fingers through it. That's what you want. So this is why I suggest starting with a small piece is at this point, um, things can get a little, a little hairy if you're not used to doing it. If it folds over on itself, it, it, it might just stick and then it might not unstick and then you kind of have to start over. So take your time, don't panic. So now I'm going to cut this in half. About half of this length is going to match up with our cookie sheet that we prepared. Okay, so I just loaded the first piece onto there. I'm using the back of my hands for the most part to handle this. It's more gentle and it'll be easier to transfer. So you can kind of get it to where you want to drop it and then just move your hands. So don't want it to overlap the other piece. If it does, then that section will take longer to bake. So you'll get some that's not quite baked through and the rest might be totally done. All right, if you have a little bit hanging over the edge like I do here, it's not the worst thing. It'll, it'll probably be fine, but I'm going to go ahead and just trim it. Okay. So that's ready to go into the oven right there. So this, this makes a decent amount of dough. So basically you can use the dough over the course of a couple of days, as long as it's wrapped tightly in paper, it'll be fine in your fridge. But if you want to make a bunch, then you can go ahead and prepare several of these cookie sheets and then bake them all at once. Just know that if you're working on the other ones while you have this one ready, it will start drying out. So uh, cover it in plastic if that's the case, if you're preparing several sheet pans, several cookie sheets at once, okay? All right, so that's ready to go. Uh, we're gonna put that into our uh, magic oven. And uh, not only does it bake it, but it also turns two pieces into one piece for some reason, and you look into that. Okay, so here's what it looks like when it comes out of the oven. Um, you can see the color. It's just a nice golden hue. Um, it's crispy. It's exactly what we want it. When it comes out of the oven, um, I don't wait until it cools off. Right as it comes out of the oven. Um, and and you, it, you can wait. You don't have to do it when it's hot. There's something about, um, I feel like the cracker might absorb the oil a little bit better if it's, if it's warm or hot when it comes out of the oven. So as it comes out, right after it comes out, go ahead and brush it, not too heavy. You want these to have the flavor of olive oil and a nice sheen, but you don't want them to be you know, too, too greasy. So then after you brush your olive oil, pick your favorite salt. I'm using a, um, this is a, a Sicilian, or yeah, Sicilian, uh, kind of like a Sicilian version of Florida cell. It's a really nice salt. I'm going to lightly season with this right on top. And then what I've done here is I've dried out a bunch of edible flowers throughout the year as I harvest things that I might not use right away. I dry them out and then keep them for occasions like this. Uh, I'm going to, I chopped them up. I'm going to sprinkle them on top. So if you have any edible flowers in your yard, I encourage you to first confirm that they're edible and then harvest the petal. You can chop them up or just tear them and fresh, fresh flowers on here would be great too. A uh, calendula is pretty common to have in people's gardens. Violas, pansies, a lot of people have those growing. Those are great to use. Roses, uh, you see roses everywhere. Roses are, all roses are edible. So you can grab some petals, chop them up, um, sprinkle them on. It makes the cracker look really beautiful. So what's cool about this is that, you know, at this point you have this one big cracker where you can like, break it in half and just rest it on top of a salad, for example, that you set in front of somebody if you want, or uh, use it as a vessel for something for an appetizer. You can put some um, pate on there or something like that. Um, for us, we're going to go ahead and just break it into rustic crackers and you know in our in our case um, we're going to just place a nice a nice stack of them on 
onto a cheese plate um, that I prepared earlier. And it makes for a nice uh, component integrate addition where, especially knowing that you made it, um, it's really nice and, and being able to add your own personal touches like the, the, the flowers that grow in your garden or fresher, so you have herbs growing in your garden, anything like that. Um, it's really great. It's a really tasty, um, simple, relatively easy to make, um, flavorful component. All right. So that's it for uh, the Carta di Musica. So the, um, the sweet things that you have recipes for, one is the um, olive oil cake. So this has a hearty amount of olive oil in it. Um, I suggest you serve it with ice cream since it's 85 degrees in here. Um, I put the dog put whipped cream on top. But if you haven't had it before, a dessert like this, especially with olive oil drizzled right on top, um, maybe not quite that much, but uh, is really delicious. Uh, a scoop of vanilla ice cream with fresh, bright olive oil on it uh, completely transforms it into its own special dessert. If you haven't tried it, please do. It's, it's really good. Uh, so this is one of the recipes. Then the, let's see, the other one are the madeleines. So madeleines are traditionally made with uh, butter. These I've made with our estate olive oil instead of butter. Uh, super delicious, really great, and the olive oil comes through very well in both of these desserts, as a matter of fact. So, um, yeah. So anyway, that's about it. I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, please enjoy our olive oil. Everybody stay safe. Hope everybody's staying healthy. And can't wait to see everybody here at the winery on Sunday soon. All right. Take care.